Right. Okay. I've got a shout at the screen. You've got a shout, Peter. Okay. So, good evening, everyone. Um, we have uh, PVZ here to complete the trilogy of River Esque talks. Um, we will end up in a trilogy of five. But I'll hand over to Peter and uh, we'll pick up on the River Esque story where we left off. Well, that's true, we won't. No, we won't. <laughs> well, <laughs> we'll go back a bit. Because there's an old educational maxim, which is tell them what you told them. <coughs> tell them, sorry, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them it, and then tell them what you told them. So what we're going to go back to is literally a hundred years ago, somewhere around now, when these characters all got together in Colchester and congratulated themselves because that thing behind them that they've been working on for over six months actually works. The wheels go round, the boiler boils water. It looks like Mr. Greenlee on the right got it right. And literally a hundred years ago, in a couple of weeks, this is about the 18th of December, 1923. It was being hauled down the station from its uh, ramp onto a carriage truck in the yard and put back in the engine shed with this marvelous Ford T machine. So a few days later, this is the 22nd of December. It got out on its first steaming up to Erton Road and they set off back again. I've got pictures that you'll have seen before, pictures possibly that you haven't seen before, and I'll try and talk on and get us right through to 19, sorry, not 19, 2023. <clears throat> so there they are, 18th of December, pretty bleak. <laughs> The engine's steaming its head off, and it goes. Now, Greenlee was actually tied up with another project at the time. This shows something of Mr Greenlee's versatility. And again, once he got a good idea, how he stuck with it. Because Mr Bassett Lout, that's the man with the head above the little engine, who was then the director of the S Road and Glass and Estelle Railway, or Narrow Gauge Railways Limited, who were operating the Raven Glass and Estelle Railway, he had a bit of business to attend to, and that was he was trying to sell methylated spirits fired engines from some upstart called LBSC. Well, that's what, that was his public name. He was Lawrence, Laurie Lawrence. He was designing small engines, same gauge, burning coal, and they could pull people. So Mr. Bassett -like thought his business was in trouble and he asked Greenlee to design an engine that would burn meths and travel on, uh, pull people along. And this is the engine. A hundred years later, it's in the museum at the moment. It's been carefully restored by its owner um, <clears throat> who runs um, the steam workshop. This is Mr. Hudson, and there's his pride and joy. They've restored it to pretty well original condition on one side, and the other side as it was found. So it's a marvellous little thing that you'll be able to see in the museum uh, special exhibition that's on until the middle of next year. <clears throat> so S goes into service doing what it was supposed to do, pull trucks out of the quarry down to Raven Glass, big loads, something like 20 or 25,000 tons. Uh, the interesting thing at the moment is actually we're doing up one of these and we've got another couple to do up at the Throwcoil Quarry Museum, but more of that on another occasion. Now, when they get to Raven Glass, uh, they need to be backed up onto the high level sidings. Now, Dave will probably know better than me, but I've only ever seen two pictures of steam engines up on those high level sidings. You see the river rest there, virtually at eaves level of the engine shed. So it was quite a gradient to get up, and this was the engine's task. In fact, the problem at the intermediate point of unloading and loading at Murthwaite was that the gradient through the trees was particularly steep, curved, and I remember being told by River Esk's, one of its original drivers, Bert Thompson, that he'd been away for a bit and away from the engine. And when he came back, 
young Bob Hardy had been given the engine, but then young Bob slithered to a stand and rolled down the hill from the Murthwaite uh, crusher siding and uh, ended up in tears. But more of that anew. Now, the idea of the engine was that it could take 25 tonnes of stone down the line to Ravenglass, turn round and go back up the line with passengers. And 150 passengers was its maximum load. Not as there many on in those days, but it looks like there's some quarry trucks on the back. And um, <clears throat> at the other end, it could turn round or not, as the case may be. The idea was the engine was equally capable in both directions. And although you can't see clearly here, immediately behind the driver's head is a set of sandboxes on the tender. So it could sand itself both from the engine, the big sandboxes above the driving <coughs> wheels, which are in the same place as they are today, and these extra sanders on the uh, tender. So back down the line here, a rare shot of something going backwards, and again, going forwards. The th interesting things are, these are the shots of it in its first year, and you can identify them by the livery, plain, absolutely plain, apart from R-E-R -R on the tender side. And um, as far as we know, the only record of it is a young Humphrey household when he passed through here in 1924, noted it as a greyish green colour. And the standard Paxman colour for pretty well any piece of machinery was a grey, not, not particularly bright bottle green. The engine's also got a disc on the front. <clears throat> it's a red disc in this instance, which means that somewhere behind it, and it is a question of somewhere, there is another train. The train is running in more than one portion. The front one would have a red, and a, if one passed with a white disc, you were clear. No disc here. Goodness knows what that stands for. I'll have to look it up in the uh, working timetable, which has survived from that period. Notice as well the front coupling on the front, which has a bar in it and also a little neck. So it'll take the flat couplings, the ones that we call the Haywood wagon couplings. There we are, R E R on the side. Again, R and E R, R E R on the side. And those pictures are the first year, 1924 in operation. Um, there were one or two, just let me get rid of something. Oh no, I've got, I've got everybody on the front. Oh, I've got rid of you all. That's all, I can see more of the picture. Um, interesting thing is, look at those flanges on the front wheels, how shiny they are. Well, the engine went through front pony wheels relatively out of, going out of fashion. There's, um, uh, those have got, very small spokes. The ones that are on the loco now have much bigger single spokes, so they're obviously not original. But in the uh, various collection of bits that we accumulate, there's a complete wheel set, front pony wheel set, and another spare wheel. So it's gone through wheels in its life on there because it had fair amounts of side control on the front and the rear. And there was a linkage to the front driving axle, sorry, the front driving wheel axle to create a, what was called a Krauss truck. So the engine had got flexibility going around bends. In my time later on, we took off the side control at the rear end and uh, that enabled the engine to go around bends much more easily. <clears throat> now, Henry Greenley, as I said, was thoroughly involved in all sorts of projects, including, as I say, that small two and a half inch gauge. And basically, when things started to get sticky at Ravenglass, he more or less gave up any connection with the project because he got better things, still dealing with Paxman's. And to some extent, it was Paxman's who sorted, sorry, who caused the problem. They'd designed into the engine something that involved their equipment. They were patentees, licenses for Lentz engines. They fitted what were poppet valves to the Lentz principle uh, on all sorts of machinery. And they wanted to sell them to railway companies. 
Uh, they thought they'd be better than slide valves and probably easier to maintain than piston valves. In those days, piston valves were relatively new and um, the rings used to wear apparently on the big trains. So Paxman's got involved and the one thing they did was make sure the engine was fitted with lens cylinders. The top bit has got pop-up valves at either end, sprung valves that were engaged by a spindle that came through from the rear of the picture out where that little screw is. And that was swung backwards and forwards by the motion inside the wheels. And the cams inside it would activate the valves. In theory, it was a good thing, but this was the first time it had been used on a railway locomotive and the, the smallest railway locomotive as it stands. It was quite a complex piece of kit on the driving mechanism, it's on the second axle, and you imagine that between the frames, they're put apart, you've got that mechanism in there. Basically, it's almost like having two sorts of eccentrics, one driven by the wheels and one held, but, sorry, held up by the reverser controls in the cab. So you could activate that long shaft rocking backwards and forwards to the cylinders on the left-hand side. As I say, a very complex piece of kit, and it didn't survive in that shape for very long. The link on the left-hand side of the picture broke when the engine caused some slipping, I think only two months after this started, and it had to be radically engineered. Now, the other thing that was in the opping, of course, was that all the drawings up to this point had actually been signed off by our friend, Mr. William Couchy. It was about the last thing he did for the Raven Grasnestow Railway. So when Mr. Greenley turned up in early June, he actually saw a bit of a fait accompli. Uh, God knows what was going on in the uh, internal power politics of the time, but there was the engine too far on to be seriously got at, so he had to make do with it. And of course, the chickens came to roost shortly after the engine was in a spit state to be steamed because they took indicator diagrams of what was going on in the cylinders. And although it doesn't stand out here, there are differences between what happens on one side of the engine, front and rear, what happens on the other side of the engine, front and rear, and the eventual, uh, sorry, the, the practical thing is that the steam is unevenly distributed as the wheels go round. So you get basically a strong puff and then a weak one. And the upshot was if the engine didn't set off, it was actually stood on a weak point, you gave it too much steam for it to grip the rails when it wooed its wheels a little bit. So slipping was a problem and the wheels were uh, having to be dealt with in inverted commas. The engine went away, we think, uh, in the early part of 24, and <clears throat> it also went away a little bit later than that. Uh, when Tom Jones started in January 1925, it wasn't actually operational. But very quickly after that, they sorted it out, they got it out of the sheds, painted it up, and it's in a new livery this time. It was a LMS sort of uh, I say an LMS, a, a maroony colour with a black edge and a straw lining. In fact, it survived inside its tender cabinet for many, many years until a colleague of mine decided one day he ought to clean inside the cabinet. He didn't clean his bait box, so when, no names, no pack drill, but he couldn't live with this old paint inside. Anyway, the other thing to watch, and although you can't see it here, is that the engine's wheels have now got bigger balance weights on the third axle. That's the one that the big rods hang on. And they were hoping to try and compensate for the, some sort of rough riding that had caused problems. Now, Greenlee had got thoroughly involved with other things. He was giving a lot of help to the Germans who were putting on an exhibition of transport and running a 15-inch gauge railway round it. This is the Krauss Pacific. Um, Mr. Henry Martins was in correspondence, we now know, 
Greenlee was sending them all sorts of assistance, drawings, etc. So those locomotives are substantially greenly oriented. We didn't realize this until the museum got some wonderful archive from um, John Milner. <clears throat> what he was involved, he'd been hijacked, of course, by two multimillionaires who were screwed into racing driving, but actually wanted a railway that they could race trains up and down on. And this was the green goddess that came to Ravenglass on trials the following year, 1925, and it showed up River Esk quite dramatically. It went back to build its own railway down at New Romney, and uh, it may not have been as adept at pulling heavy loads as River Esk, but it was certainly out of the drawing board, onto the rails, and a surefire winner. There were lots of little things that people have improved over the years, but those machines were showing up what River Ash wasn't. The other thing that was affecting what was going on at Ravenglass was, of course, the arrival of this wonderful machine, innovatory and uh, bulletproof pretty well. This is the Quarryman, which arrived in 1926 and currently at Krauss, but returning to the museum while we raise more funds to get it into working order again. Now, Ash went into service, running up and down, doing what it could because the railway needed. It was running a daily service every day, including Christmas Day. And the River Esk was basically pride of the line and fundamental to keeping the show on the road. It's wonderful to see some of these pictures, a set of Haywood coaches at the new Delgarth station, um, you know, where periods overlap. And behind it, we can see the houses of uh, the farm that's now derelict and the, uh, the, the, well, the smithy and the offices in the trees there of the um, iron mines at Boot, which were only just then out of use. Now, this might sort of make people think, but what did River Esk achieve by having these valves and things that didn't really work properly. Well, in a, in a sort of backhanded way, one of those unintended consequences was that Lens sorted themselves out. Oh, sorry, Paxman, the Lens project, sorted themselves out and worked out you could drive those pop-up valves with the Lens valve system through different means, different valve gears, rotary ones. And Sir Nigel Gresley incorporated that in the first P2, the Cock of the North. And uh, Walshert's valve gear and Chapelon came along and dealt with Lentz directly so that in a peculiar unintended consequences way, refreshed by not being successful, made damn sure some of the other bigger projects in the railway world were successful. It's a bit of a stretch of the imagination, but don't worry about it. Now, Paxman's went into handling um, internal combustion on a bigger scale than they'd invested in and many other places had invested in. And that became their principal uh, activity. And of course, we know now that eventually Paxman's put their uh, motors into the high-speed trains. And one of the splendid things about circumstances is that we are talking about another century of operation for River Esk, while the high-speed train has done half a century and is coming out of service use. Now, what River Esk actually was up against <clears throat> was that the railway had done something radical to their big engine, Muriel. When it had its old-fashioned boiler on, it couldn't steam, it couldn't go very fast, pull it could, but steam it couldn't. So they got a boiler from a new company, involved with them, Yorkshire Engine Company. And for about 180 quid, I can't find the exact figure in my head at the moment, they revitalised this loco. And frankly, it was the best 180 quid the railways ever paid in its life. Here it is. It was, wasn't quite River Ert in name then, but that was the River Ert at Delgarth standing waiting to go. Now, the Yorkshire Engine Company, who'd supplied this boiler, were also 
in cahoots with a local engineer. He's born in Ulverston, a guy called Pulteney. And Pulteney had a, an idea that you could use some of the extra weight that trains, loco, steam locos were pulling round in their tenders. It might vary a bit because at the end of the day, the engine would have less coal and at certain times it would have less water. But nevertheless, there was a weight there. And if you could power the mechanism that held that weight and grip the rails, then you might have uh, effectively a more powerful engine, effectively a double engine, because it could be controlled from the <coughs> one position where the driver was already. And these were the patent details. Well, the Yorkshire Engine Company were in with the patent, and these were engines that they were trying to get involved and sell abroad. The interesting thing is that the engines had a set of cylinders underneath the cab end, and therefore the steam supply, which came down from the front of the engines, normal supply to the cylinders on the right-hand side, would have a short journey to travel. However, the version they put on the River Esk, uh, and it was being developed as a sort of uh, publicity thing, uh, had the cylinders at the rear so that the steam supply to the rear engine had to come all the way down from the front, something like 18 feet, wandering around the outside of the footwell where the driver was going to stand. So potentially there was trouble there. Although it doesn't look obvious here, the old tender had been raised up with a sufficient footwell underneath uh, <coughs> for the driver to stand in. At the rear, there was a cupboard built for a, um, a pump to pump water back into the boiler because they had wanted to use up the steam that came through from the rear engine without having to put it up a pummel. So it was used as feed water, heating, and it would practically have worked. Uh, reputedly, it doubled the weight that the train could, the engine could pull to 50 tonnes from 25. Uh, there were some demonstration trials apparently with it. Um, it must have been interesting to drive because barely did it fit on the turntable and you would have all the extra complication of steam in the system, long steam pipes full of steam, trying to control them, inching your way onto the turntable. Um, it wasn't quite as complicated as some of the other ends. It's the river mic conversion that was ahead of it here in the photo line. But nevertheless, <clears throat> It did a few years from 1928 through to 1931, we think. And here it is at Ravenglass. However, um, the River Ert, the simple River Ert, was the local of choice when you wanted to pull a big load. Here it is with one of the bigger loads setting up in Ravenglass on a busy day. And River Esk at the back there doesn't appear to have a significant train on behind it. But whenever you see the pictures, they always seem to be steam everywhere coming out of every nook and cranny. Here is at Estelle Green. Again, they've just started to accelerate the train to gallop through the station and get up the bank and steam everywhere. <clears throat> so not an entirely satisfactory situation, potentially. Although, as I say, it ran and there weren't too many legends of it doing nasty things. However, it turned out that one day in, I think, early 1931, Tom Jones was trying to do something to get it out. There was some fault or other, and they actually just lifted the tender and stuck it on two bits of wood and two bogies that they had lying around, and it managed to run like that for the next 40 years. The odd pictures you can see here uh, stood at the water tank, newly being restored, and uh, behind it, a little luggage truck. But one of those things you can count when you're looking at this locomotive is how many boiler bands has it got? And here you can see there's one just behind the nameplate. And there it is again. So earlier pictures of the engine in the 1930s show it with that extra boiler band. And in a minute or two, you'll see that the boiler band disappears. It's there actually as decoration because the um, 
piece of oxidated, a piece of boiler cladding at that point was continuous from the dome through to the smoke box. One of the sad things away is that there aren't any colour pictures of the time. So we're reliant on a couple of bits of artwork to see probably what the engine's colour scheme and potentially the colour scheme of the carriages. So this is a painting and here is a cigarette card. So obviously engine was a middish green and the coaches look like a deep red maroon. Whether there was anything whereby the Great Western Railway before it went to chocolate and cream had coaches like this colour, who knows? <clears throat> However, we've got to the point where at the end of 1939 season, the last specials ran in August and very, very quickly, the railway went into a more wartime type mode. Uh, the passenger service literally ceased overnight, such as it was even the once a week Thursdays that ran right through the year stopped. That was a, a shopping excursion to get people to the main line or Whitehaven Market. <clears throat> and the only thing that ran on the line were the diesels, or sorry, the petrol locos. And so in the engine sheds, things went to some extent from bad to worse. The old engine shed at the rear had an extension on the front. Sometime during the war, we think that blew down and was never replaced or repaired. And there are pictures later on, which I haven't got on today, where Robin Bottrell turned up in 1944, 45, and the front of the engine shed is completely open. It was not gated, nothing. I remember being told by an old gentleman who was a young lad during the war how they used to come and sit on the engines in the shed. Nobody chased them off and would play at driving the trains up and down. And they just sat there. After the war, the first year of operation, the passenger tractor was the only means of mission. And it was the following year, 1946, when they got the River Ert steamed up again. We're not quite sure why River Ert was the preferred engine at this point, but it may well be simply a matter of the boiler condition. The boilers have been radically overhauled about 1931, which actually wasn't long after River Ert had had its new boiler, and not actually that much longer for River Esk. Nevertheless, for the first few years of the post-war period, it was River Ert that ran up and down. Here it is in the late 1940s. The shelter has been finished. The toilets are up and it's River Earth. I'm sorry, I should have tried to find the undoctored one here, but this is River Esk's boiler in the sheds, potentially in that period when it was under repair, waiting to come back into service. And here it is sparkling in this is probably about 1953 because in the background, it had been in service a year by then, in the background you can see the waiting shelter that later became Mrs. Max Tea Bar, done up with the decorations for the coronation. There we are. <coughs> At one point there were shields and um, other things, banners everywhere, and uh, this is in that early 1950s period. Shelter there was actually partly used in the winter time for storing some of the coach equipment. Anyway, River Esk went back into service in 1952 and became something of an icon for the railway. <coughs> the wonderful shots of running through the landscape that used to be, I mean, sadly, in inverted commas, from my point of view, I recall these open fields before anybody got a need to plant them. And um, although practically it was useless farming, it was a big bog and uh, it used to quake when the train ran over it if you were walking along the line side. Or if you're working there and you got a crowbar and just shoved it in the ground, it went, it went down straight through. And the trees have actually dried up the landscape there. 
And of course, the land went round the outside of Gilbert's cutting. Uh, in, as we know it, it went round the curves of um, <clears throat> uh, Hollinhow, Hollinhead, sorry, and into Delgarth. Now, one of the interesting things I mentioned earlier was that the loco lost that boiler band. It's silly little things that make people interested. But um, I was many years later on at Romney, and a gentleman came up to me and said, when did the boiler band disappear? Uh, I said, you're not a gentleman who lived in South Wales who was notorious for looking at detail of things, and it was. But anyway, there's a very small group of us who were interested in why the engine should lose boiler bands. It here entering Delgarth and here standing at Ravenglass about to set sail. The sad thing about this photo is, of course, the changes are taking place. There's a new building, the shop and uh, booking office behind the flagpole in the middle of the picture, but also a fence across the connection that would have led on to the standard gauge route to Merthwaite, because now the quarries are closed, the Merthwaite standard gauge has been taken up by this stage, 57 or thereabouts, the Kerstewart diesel would have gone off to the National Coal Board. <clears throat> so River, I don't know why we, ah, never mind. Here we are outside the loco sheds at Ravenglass, the old coaling plant, which was fed by, sorry, I say coaling plant, because of course the engines burnt coke in those days. <clears throat> the other detail to look at is the front coupling, because that's one of the original features that uh, Greenley designed, a combined wagon and coach coupling. And there's its driver of the period, shoveling coke in. This is, um, oh, come on, my name's gone. Never mind. <laughs> be, uh, Bert, one, sorry? Dick yeah, it's like Dick Long. Yeah. <laughs> so I've been thinking too much. Very difficult. And there you can see the handle on the back of the cupboard that was at the back of the tender when the equipment was removed from the condensers of the uh, water feed. <clears throat> We're coming. Thank you. No, that was Dick Long. Dick Nick was River Earth's driver at <clears throat> that point. <clears throat> anyway, here they are about to set sail on what might have been one of the last excursions. And actually, of course, it, it wasn't. We all know different now. But it is interesting to go back to that period because there were very real concerns on all sides. The gentleman who was the uh, solicitor, who's left some splendid archive material <laughs> to the railway, said, they were actually quite concerned that nobody would turn up and cancel the sale because they got better title. Uh, Colin Gilbert certainly didn't want to get involved. I was reading the other day how, because he'd approached the uh, Board of Trade on whether they could use the old Raven Glass and Estelle Railway Company name again, uh, the Treasury Solicitor, that's the chief government law officer, the treasury solicitor was wandering about sending memos uh, here, there and everywhere. So it really was quite a fraught period that we really can't appreciate at this point. However, there were changes afoot and the trains still kept running. That was the important thing. Here they are steaming up in the engine shed. This is River Esk on the far side. Uh, one of the splendid things was that um, they put an extension chimney up, and there was a thing driven by something like a vacuum cleaner to generate an air jot. The other thing that you can just see poking out of the cab are two little curved pipes. <clears throat> They're actually connections to the uh, main cylinder lubricator that was mounted in the cab at the time, and the drivers used to brightly polish them they stopped using them just before my time. But we were aware that passengers would go around patting the engine and 
touching all these bits. And these, of course, were absolutely steam temperature, in it, not quite red hot, but take your skin off hot. Anyway, there we are, River Esk being steamed up alongside of it. There's Dick again. And uh, one or two changes coming to be obvious. The engine's got a different coupling on. There's a nice screw coupling. It was chromium plated and <clears throat> it was pinched from the Royal Anchor diesel loco that arrived on the railway at the time. Sadly, though, they fitted doors to the shed. I say sadly, but not improved the ventilation. So that if you were on a wet day and you kept the doors shut while you were steaming up, the engine shed filled with fumes. And the secret was to go and have a cup of tea. Um, no doubt everybody smoked in those days, but having to smoke tarry sleeper vapour every morning certainly didn't do these gentlemen any good at all. And there were changes of books. Uh, slow but surely things were changing. This is the new driver of the 1965 period, Cyril Holland. I say new driver because Cyril had been a guard on the line back in 1922. And uh, he'd worked in the quarries with his family when they closed in 1953. He went on building. Um, he went to build the Roman fort at Hard Knot. And hence Delgarth Cottages and a new nickname, Cyril Arculum, the local name for Delgarth Cottages. You can see the engines change colour as well because we were in a period, this was shortly after the uh, Cyril started, the locos still a green, lined out, R and &E R on the side, but steaming up the line on a wet day with David Bell on the side of the engine. David was a guard <clears throat> and uh, they always travelled on the engine. Now, the thing was that Something was afoot. The engine had got its new wheels back in 1923, sorry, 24, 25. It had um, given the old wheels to the chassis that ran under the tender, and they were stuck on one side then for the next several decades. They, of course, became a power unit for River Mike. So Although you can see here, look at closely the driving wheels of the engine, the main bit, the third set underneath the sandbox has a bigger, uh, <coughs> a bigger balance weight. And on the rear end, there's no such evidence of that. So anyway, they became the River Mike. And uh, we won't devolve too much onto its story, except that it's pretty much a dead ringer for River Earth. Sorry, River Esk. <laughs> and here they were, occasionally double heading. And uh, you can see from the uh, person in the cab now of River Esk that something's gone on to alter where the sitting position was. On our earlier picture, Cyril and his guard are looking over the cab roof. And uh, later on, we modified the cab so that you could sit inside. The lady there actually works for. Uh, the people who built our three foot gauge coach. Uh, hello, Sarah. Whoops. And as I say, the alteration of position meant you could sit down and pretty well drive through the spectacles and take advantage of the sliding roof that gave you protection on wet days. Cyril here. Uh, not driving, because somebody else is on the other side having a play. But here we are with the engine. It was turned uh, black in 1967, almost in a hurry, because the original idea that Douglas had had was that uh, River Earth would be blue, River Esk would, I think, stay green, and the new engine was going to be furnace red. They were going to be different colours. However, Having told the Reverend Audrey that for his new Little Railways book, Colin Gilbert got involved and decided he didn't like the idea of River Esk being 
green and river art being blue, keep river art in green, and I wanted a London Northwestern coloured a black engine, so River S became the black engine. <clears throat> a few years later, this would be 1969, it got a new tender, and this was designed on the uh, more or less the profile of the River Mike tender. Others were slightly different, a uh, bit bigger cutaways, and uh, here it ran with RER, RER on the side. That didn't last particularly long. But uh, also look at the detail inside the cab, the rear of the back head that the drivers will be looking at all day. These were painted silver in those days. It was um, interesting to have to put fresh silver paint on, usually when the engine was in steam. So there's lots of smell and occasionally it set fire to you. Anyway, there we have River Esk passing River Might at a road and another new face on the loco. This is Glyn Wells, who had come up from Salisbury. He'd been a fireman on the main line on the Bully Pacifics and all the rest of the engines. He'd got tired of being a second man. He'd been involved at Longleat and his friend Benny Benstead had been here for about a year beforehand. So he brought his family up and... Here he is coking the engine. <clears throat> he was here at Ravenglass when the uh, Northern Chief came and today we can see what we can get. Uh, there were several days of operations with Northern Chief here back in November of 1971. It turned into a gathering of little trained people from all over the country. And it was quite a high occasion. Um, there was a certain background to it, of course, in that nobody actually knew at the moment the engine was here whether the Romney Hydenden Church would run again. As it was here, a consortium that was to take it over because the original uh, current owners of the time were going to close it. <clears throat> I got a ride on the engine, a ride on the carriages, and uh, it was at this period when I was actually first involved as a summer driver on the old passenger tractor. And uh, we had various assistants, like that young man there, Mr Stockton, coming guarding. And as it happened, both Mr Stockton and myself um, took, a, uh, what should we say, from our proper jobs, <coughs> and, uh, started on the railway together. He started on the... Uh, Monday of Easter week, and I started on Monday, Thursday, so he got seniority over me. Anyway, it was an interesting period. This is an appalling picture, but you can see possibly out of it, it's the cab of the passenger tractor. Somebody's run ahead to change the points at the Merthwaite siding. I found this and couldn't resist it. I'm afraid I haven't found any better one. And ahead of us is a steam loco with a train waiting to pass at Merthwaite. Goodness only knows what people would really think about ever doing anything like this, especially when the spanner for the points was actually hidden underneath the points, highly secure, because as Cyril said, there's a hadder has lives under there, so we had security beyond measure, and there was an adder that lived under the point handle, and it came out one day and Cyril tried to kill. Don't kill it, Cyril. Just let it go to sleep. It, if it bites you, <laughs> it's going to cause us more trouble. Anyway, it was a lovely shot. Well, Rimresk, although it wasn't the um, uh, the flagship operation of the time, because actually River Might became a bit of a flagship engine, uh, it was the engine of choice when some grandees from the mainline railway came to travel. And here they are on their special train with Glyn polished up as well as the engine. Um, a little story to tell because I was given the task of driving Sheila around the system uh, on a substitute diesel train. <clears throat> and while we were at Delgarth, in those days, British Rail had just invented the double arrow symbol. And at Ravenglass, we had a 
it was uh, another decreasing anti-clockwise arrow. It's in theory the um, path of a snail vanishing up its... Um, 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 we won't go there. But it, it became a, a little moniker that was on things in those days, the uh, little ratty arrow. So Sheila came down, we'd stuck on two hastily cut out white uh, pieces of paper on the side of the cab. And as we rolled into Ravenbat, uh, the general manager caught sight of this and one could tell that he wasn't best pleased, I think. It's... <laughs> anyway, nothing more was said until the end of the day and these gentlemen had gone away on their special train down the line and the general manager came into the signal box and said with a gesture and to you lot. <laughs> <laughs> However, um, as I said, Trevor and I got the opportunity to come and work on the railway and this was one of the things that actually I started to change on the engine. Um, there were two things I'd done straight away. One, I caught my scalp on the sharp edge of the sliding cab roof. So I took a file to it and it didn't do that ever again. Now, the other thing we used to do was take the dome cover off in between trips and then polish it because it used to tarnish quite badly with such heat. But after a couple of years of this, I dropped the damn thing. And there was a loud resounding bong as it hit the ground. It was perfectly all right when I picked it up, but I didn't think it would be. And I decided that there ought to be a better way. So we put some foil insulation under the dome and it managed to keep it from tone tarnished and you don't have to take it off in between turns. There we are oiling something. We've got the front coupling pinched off Royal Anchor and we're about to set sail up the line on some adventure or other. Every time seemed, every day seemed to be an adventure in those days. Sometimes it was something novel like going to Oakton Road with a special to see the Duke of Edinburgh go to the Outward Bound School. And there was something extra in the autumn and winter. I couldn't tell you whether this particular excursion train, I found it on a website. It had been to Ravenless and it was going round tracks that would now be impassable because these are at Carnforth onto the Furness and Midland Junction. But at Ravenglass, it would involve lots of activity, trains running up the line in succession in order to get up to Dalegarth and then back down again with only the passing loops at Erton Road and the possibility of Dalegarth. Um, it was quite, what should we say? I think if Neil Glover was here, he would remember, I believe it was autumn 1984 and the Hull excursion. The secret, of course, was that different trains needed to run round or do what they had to before you let another one in. It was possible to pass four trains at Delgarth using the siding that's between the walls. The first one had to come in, run round and then pull its train with passengers into the siding. The next one came in and would run round before the third one came in. And the fourth one was then in the, allowed into the walls on the inner running line, such as where River Esk is now. And the first one would be allowed to leave. However, if you didn't get them run round in the right order, you ended up with two engines at the turntable several hundred people getting wet and a very difficult situation to sort out all against the clock on this particular occasion poor glynn's been sent out on river Earth. Um, <clears throat> and on this occasion i was supposed to take the heavy train because i had a fresh engine glynn was going to take river Earth round the system on two trips have a bit of a lie and then come out with the last portion, the light train. However, the general manager took it into his head to put him on the teaks. Even though it was the last portion, it was the old fashioned, plain bearing teak open coaches that he had to pull up with extras 
and he had not a very good journey because in those days we had normally an hour between trains to clean the fire and start fresh with a decent amount of coke having removed the clinker. Glyn didn't have that opportunity. He was sent out fairly fresh uh, into the wilds and had what can only be described as a stinker of a journey. Uh, he was going to go down first, so he set off, got to the climb into a road and ran out of go. Di Pickup was driving the evening train, an almost unheard of occasion, but Di came forward to pull and assist. They pulled the earth back into the station, stuffed it in the other loop, all in time for me to appear, running at 10 minute intervals. Um, no, what should we say? No other signalling in place. And um, I duly rolled into Raven Glassworks. The signals are there, past the general manager in the signal box. The general manager was quite relieved after a delay when he hadn't heard from anybody for some time. He was quite relieved to see a train appear. Then he realised it was the train that set up second. Right. <clears throat> so what changed? Well, the sorts of things changed. At this point, the railway's telephone system was between the stations using GPO lines. Um, things were going to have to change because his, Her Majesty in those days had decided through the Health and Safety at Work Act that it had obligations to look after people travelling on the Ravengrass and Estel Railway, which didn't exist before, and things were going to change there. So there needed to be proper communication up and down the line. And the first thing was started with a lot of voluntary activity. Our working parties of the period were composed of digging holes, broadling it was called, and erecting telegraph poles to achieve a line telephone system. Let's see if we can make it work. There it is. Glyn spent a lot of time not just making it work, but tangling everything together with sufficient cable to join everything up. The other thing that changed is that the trains were getting continuous brakes fitted. And although the steam loco there has got a black pipe on because it hasn't actively got brakes on the locomotive, it does have a system now to generate air to work the brakes on the trains. And of course, we were very quickly after that, the radio operating system that came in. I'm sorry about these next couple of pictures. I have to nick them out of the book. But these were from an Ian Allen book, which was published shortly afterwards. And they were quite, uh, what should we say? <clears throat> I took pictures of Douglas on the control desk, as it then was, and me sat in a cab with the radio system. There's the... Uh, ready phone radio that we used at the time it sat inside a cupboard a cover that a steel box cover to keep some of the rain off and uh, it basically took up quite a bit of the spare side of the cab and this was thankfully just about in position when the railway was offered extra trade on the busiest days of the year already it was the Cumbrian Coast Express years of 1978, 79, and through after that. The um, engines that came were the big locos of the period, Nigel Gresley here arriving at Roden Glass, and then they would transfer, and another set of locos would take them back at the end of the day. But these things had to run on time because some of them came from Houston. It was as good as that. The Solari board at the Houston departure had actually got a Ravenglass thing on every one of its sessions. Well, after the first year, which was fairly difficult, the second year of that operation in the summertime, Graham had got his hand on it. And basically, you didn't just run a 20-minute service to carry the punters off the train. You started your 20-minute service early with the diesels, and you ran them around, and you... <clears throat> try to get spare people off the streets until the big train arrived, whenever it arrived, because that was a bit of a flexible art. And then you've got to get 200, 300 people, whatever they were, up the valley and back down again. Well, of course, the rail car was a 
vital part of this, and so was Sheila, until the rail car started being difficult and the Sheila wasn't much better. Um, so the rail car and Sheila were being towed, sorry, Sheila was towing the rail car around. Um, there was a particular incident where it uh, uh, derailed because somebody looked out coming round Rock Point. Thankfully, looked out the door side. Um, it was discovered that the trailing cars have been fitted with a um, stop mechanism. So they, But the power car, which was the first piece of equipment on that unit, hadn't been retrofitted with these stops. Anyway, on this particular occasion, Sheila had been sent ahead with the rail car. And when I got to Worton Road, we discovered it was in the siding. It had, Sheila had run out of go completely. I don't know exactly what had happened, but it had got into the siding. And when we got there, we had a full train, but there was another several dozen people to try and get on. So anyway, my guard, Sid, shunted out the last two carriages of the rail car. We coupled them on the rear of our train. We got everybody in. We set sail for Delgarth, and um, we finally got there um, with Sid hanging out of the what would have been the back control desk of the rear coach of the rail car, the one that's looking at us there, literally hanging on by his fingernails. Well, there were so many people on the train, oh, it was going well, no point in worrying, we'll get to Delgarth and we'll sort it out. And uh, while we were taking water quietly, um, was it full at the back seat? Oh, he said, he had a lovely Welsh voice in those days. Oh, he said, there was a family of four and a very large dog in the back compartment. So we were four. Anyway, we got steamed up on these occasions and managed usually without too much hassle to get everybody home again at night. Um, what can be shown here that's different? Well, don't worry about the driver. I was only on a, ever on two postcards, and one of them had me eating my lunch. <laughs> but as I said, the engine, the one thing probably that made the biggest difference to working the trains was braking, braking on the trains. The idea of coming down to Mike Side Loop uh, with its five mile an hour restriction and the possibility that it might not be set for you without the help of indicators. Um, on a greasy rail with a heavy load, working on either the loco brake, which was a steam brake on the driving wheels, or putting the engine in reverse. And you had to be careful if you had the engine in reverse and put the brake on, because the wheels would immediately pick up and you'd be skating. Um, train braking was the biggest advance that you could imagine. And there on the loco, it's the small pump that this particular engine was first fitted with. River Might had a duplex pump, which should have worked better back in the 1970s. The society had fitted it. It didn't function as it should. And a gentleman called Arthur Bailey from Newby Bridge cut it in two and made two working pumps and then a series of much bigger ones that are on some of the locos to this day. And uh, they're a tribute to him. There's a later pump. This was a different version. This was uh, provided at those points from a gentleman called Satow, Michael Satow, who was involved at the Leighton Buzzard Line and had devised a little pump that would work on the tiny engines on the Leighton Buzzard Line. <clears throat> and it got fitted to River Esk um, because River Esk big pump was being troublesome. And also they were sending engines to Japan they wanted this engine to be a test bed for the Japanese engines, which is actually quite useful because although I got to Japan very briefly, it was at a time when the engine we'd sent then, the Cumbria, decided to throw a wobbly with its air pump. So I had to take it apart and mend it. And um, I've never seen such gratitude out of people for mending something, um, especially because I could do it with my fingers being hardened at the ends. The Japanese gentleman thought this was something beyond measure. However, we weren't completely out of the woods because something else was going wrong with the engines. The boilers were giving severe trouble. Back in 19, ooh, when is this, 1980, the 
boilers were being affected because the coke we got that year, suddenly one load used to change a bit every year. I'm sorry, every load used to change because the colliery that fed the coking plant was changing. And this particular load had a high sulfur content and it affected the boilers more or less within days, I think it's two or three days of starting a batch of coke, the boilers were showing leaking tubes, leaking stays, leaking anything, because the sulphur in the damp conditions turned into sulfurous acid and literally ate away the bits that were sealing our boilers up. So in the middle of August, we had a session with boilers being taken off engines, being retubed, and River Esk was sent out on its second lot of tubes of tube trouble in desperation with a load of coal that the fitters of the day, when they turned up at traction engine values, and somebody brought a bag of coal round. Oh, we'll have one of them, even though they'd only attended with a model or a stationary engine. So David Clay and Ian Page brought this coal home, and we finally used it. Then we got on to burning Welsh coal. Well... This was a real eye-opener, and it was splendid stuff. It changed sometimes because the colliery closed and we went to the next one. But we burned coal from pretty well every pit in the Welsh coal field, and the whole thing was transformed. Coke was an art form. Uh, we could tell you tales about burning coke that you wouldn't believe. And it made you think that working our trains with coke in the boilers and no brakes and no signalling was pretty well what they were doing back in 1830 on the Liverpool and Manchester. So we hadn't really got very far. However, there we were. <clears throat> so we'd solved that by burning this, except the problem now was River S spoiler that was fitted uh, in 1923 had had a new firebox, inner and outer, in 1965 after the Romney engines but also had new boilers from the same boiler company. And the um, problem with the River S boiler was it's starting to show problems with water treatment. High alkalinity had caused what was called caustic cracking, or uh, basically cracks were developing between the stays. And you would get to a point where Sometime during the day, you thought oh, there was a little wisp of something in the corner of the cab. And by the time you got home at night, it was more than a little wisp. So the engineers had to take the cab off and the fittings weld up a crack. And the final thing was when I rang them up one morning and said, uh, it started again. And we hadn't even left the shed. That was the last time that old boiler steamed. And it's now in the museum here as an example. It's an example in another way because... The Romney engines that were fitted with new boilers at the earlier time than the River Esk had its firebox, those boilers with proper water treatment and proper controls are as good as the day they were put in. But anyway, it was an opportunity for somebody else. The gentleman had got contact with uh, Lord Wakefield, and he was a gentleman who got... He was a, uh, an, an engineer, but an academic engineer, John Sharp, and he got an idea promoting in those days some form of new steam traction. And <clears throat> basically, the River S boiler was altered. So the boiler that was being built to be fitted in 1983 was altered to take advantage of burning extra volatile coal that would make smoke under normal circumstances. The slight problem was that it came without the instruction book. And um, thankfully, we were talking with the Festiniog Railway. We had good friends down there who were dealing with something called the gas producer combustion system. And they came to Ravenglass and we were struggling, to say the least, with the River Esk because it got all these holes into the firebox to let air in. It wouldn't steam at all. Well, we were putting steam under the grate, they said. So that afternoon, on the return of this trial run, we invented a steam supply off the air pump 
and fed it under the ash pan. This is the later version when the engine was stripped down for other attention. But ahead of us, you could see on the left-hand side of the picture with a brass lubricator, the air compressor. A pipe off it would feed to the front of the engine. You can see the saddle of the front where the boiler smoke box would sit and the chimney above. So that would normally take the exhaust of the air pump that way. We teed onto it and brought some steam out and put it under the fire. And the difference was dramatic. It was beyond belief. You ended up with an iridescent glow in the firebox. And the following year, it would steam on the dirtiest of coal that you could imagine. We were following the footsteps of hundreds who were about 10 years in from altering uh, their standard engines to burn the rubbish coal that was in the coal pits, uh, in the coal pits and not cause pollution from uh, built-up areas. We were also in the line with what had been done in the deepest South America. A gentleman called Senor Porter had altered some two foot six gauge locomotives, which are quite remarkable. They could pull thousand ton trains from a coal pit on the Rio Turbio. And we were also aware that similar alterations were being made to South African engines. And this was the Red Devil, which at the time was pretty well the apple of everybody's eye uh, as an improved steam locomotive that could basically on economics and all sorts of other reasons, keep diesels and electrification at bay. <laughs> as I said, we were in cahoots with our friends at the Festinio, this is Terry Turner, then the uh, operating manager on the Linda. And you can see steam under the cab being fed into the ash pan of the locomotive. And in those days, their engines were being burning oil to avoid pollution and to um, <clears throat> avoid fire risk. An ordinary coal was out of the question. Well, this was quite, quite amazing to get on and make it steam against the journeys that it had to do. So we ended up with deeper contact with Dr. Sharp because we tinkered about. He said, you, you've got to play with it to get it right. I know, well, we played with it. And I like to think we did get it right because in the first couple of years, we burnt uh, many tons of some rubbish American coal. But if you'd let Martin burn, it would be like the destroyers at Jutland. You wouldn't see the valley from one end to the other. This a faint grey haze. And there's Dr. Sharp and some colleagues that he brought from Switzerland. These were colleagues of the uh, uh, Dr. Waller who built new rack engines uh, that are still operating to this day. And Roger Waller got involved with us. They were wanting some readings to see if a small boiler like this could generate steam um, burning all sorts of fuels. So River Esk was here, piped up for combustion analysis at different points, temperature gauges, and all sorts of things. And we did manage to steam literally on wood chips. So there may be a future in this, who knows? Uh, but it does indicate that one can be, uh, we were many years before our time in trying to be environmentally friendly, but the aim was to see what could burn inside the firebox. We did a day of constant running between Monkester Mill and Bort Mill Summit, taking all the readings, including burning uh, Laosan sewage sludge. So all things are possible. I mean, if you're looking at pictures and want to see the changes over the years, the first situation, we had two blowers, one either side of the firebox. You see a little pipe there opposite the builder's plate on the side, a little pipe feeding steam into an air. And afterwards, it was we worked out we didn't need these blowers. We could just regulate the amount of air in when the engine wanted it. 
And you can, although I'm sorry it's not in focus, you can see a steam pipe disappearing that would feed underneath the engine. And for what good it was, we got a prize for doing it. And more to the point, thousands of pounds, I can't remember what it was, which was the prize, we, um, uh, Ian Page, managed to fit the air jets into the engine shed air, uh, sorry, steam um, exhausting chimneys, so the lighting up chimneys, so that the world of the engine shed changed dramatically. You could live in there in any conditions. You could raise steam without issues at any time. Anyway, we went down to the Romney Hyde and Dimchurch Railway in 1995, uh, sorry, 85, first of all, as a result of the Paxman Jubilee celebrations. So there's River Esk. I think I've shown these before, but River Esk on the front of the two original Paxman engines built by Zabrowski, number two behind and number one behind again. We had something like 27 carriages. And um, I know that uh, we've been upstaged this last year, but this was the olden days. We went off pulling this immense train. And after the first bridge, I said to my pilot, pilotman and fireman, George Farmer, I had offered him the drive. He said, no, no, I'll fire, I'll fire. Um, we went through the first bridge and it became obvious that the train was hanging back. So when I looked back over the cab, I could see the next driver, Sooty, as he was called, waving at me, smiling. And the exhaust out of the chimney was just limp, doing nothing. Likewise, on the back engine with Richard Batten, they just waved. So I said to George, is this a put-up job? Theatre, lad, he said. Theatre. We won't be doing this again. Little did he know, because he didn't live for long enough. But anyway, it was a splendid trip out, and we pulled them all through to the Prince of Wales, and then it did get a bit of help from the Prince of Wales. But we managed a steady 18 mile an hour with all this lot on behind, and that's the sole exhaust out of the engine burning, whatever uh, interesting coal the Romney had at the time. Now, a following visit we took to Rum, there's another little thing. You look at little things on the engine. They're highlighted underneath the knobs on the back of the engine. There's a piece of iron bar, steel bar with a, an L top on it, fastened to a bar that crossed the engine. It's fastened to the sanders. Well, it was put on in a hurry. It was put on at New Romney because we'd gone back to New Romney and at this moment we were going to do a uh, parallel run, as they called it, the two engines running side by side. So we slithered all the way to Hythe, and at Hythe I went to call on the man. The brakes, have, sorry, the, 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 the sanders have been also disconnected because the engine had a brake ejector fitted in the cab that got in the way. <laughs> so I said to the engineer of the railway, Tony Crowhurst, who had his workshop in the shed. Um, could you just do a little job to me? There a bit of bar welded on here. Oh, yeah, yeah. Zzz. It was on, just like that. So when we came to leave, we set off with the addition of sand. And you can see that we're slightly accelerating. We weren't sanding over the points at this point. <coughs> but we managed to get considerably ahead of the Romney train. So that when it did get going and passed us, <coughs> it was travelling at a terrific speed. It did make the job of meeting on the level crossings, as you had to do in those days, a little tricky. But it's a good day out, and uh, we're also fastened up with all sorts of <coughs> equipment to uh, monitor combustion. Now, combustion monitoring wasn't in it because the last major thing to happen to River S was, of course, it was in the fire. It had been stripped down to go in the workshop, taking its turn for a major overhaul. And very sadly, all the equipment was taken off. Thankfully, the engine was on upside down, on a wagon, and it was in a position where it could just be pushed out of the workshop, out of the way, sorry, 
see if I can make it. Of course, that disastrous fire that could have killed somebody, it could have had all sorts of implications, but at least the locos got pushed out. Uh, River Might hadn't got its side rods on, and as I say, River S chassis was on the wagon. So they were out of the way, but all the other bits of River S needed effectively total renewal. I won't say the engine's a complete new engine, but Nigel Day, who took in hand the great rebuilding uh, and completing the loco, has done a tremendous amount to the engine all the way through. The one bit I think that makes the most difference is this is exhaust system. It looks all covered in soot and crap here, but actually the thing that's going up the chimney ahead of us has four nozzles. And underneath it at the bottom is a divider device called a Cordina. <clears throat> and basically one side of the engine chopping exhausts some of the steam out of the other side of the engine and reduces back pressure. And the end result is a dramatic increase in efficiency. So there's the chairman of the board, just retired, Peter Hensman, uh, bringing River S back into service and Nigel taking due credit for it. Um, and of course, there were all sorts of other changes at the time. You'll see there's a new tender, uh, aping the style of the original. Uh, side walls of the tyres cleaned up and a multi facet there's a four jet lubricator on the uh, main lubrication system. It's uh, a tremendous machine and um, I'm only pleased that I actually had a few years of driving it out of the, if my last trip had been the one where we were at Erton Road, the other end of the station, and I'd shut the regulator when the thing had lost some equipment inside and the regulator basically was jammed shut. So we were a tow-it-home job, but actually we weren't in anybody's danger field. However, it would have been sad not to get on the engine again. Um, and it's running. The Paxman uh, HSTs, which were powered from the factory where River S was born. They're all coming to the end, literally, of their working life. And um, we've managed to do a few things. I could find all sorts of stories. I really ought to try and put some of them down on paper. One entertaining one was we, we actually pulled the Royal Train. I had to invent some extra discs to go on the front to have the statutory four discs on the front of the engine. Old George Barlow, on River, sorry, not River, on Green Goddess had travelled around. He Apparently he'd kept four discs on the engine all the time from when he carried Her Majesty uh, Prince Charles on the engine through to the end of his driving career, just in case they came again. But I didn't worry about that too much, but they gave me a royal standard to fly on the front, which we fastened to the brake pipe. And the sad thing was, I got back to the engine shed. I thought, God, no discomfort yet. And then an equerry appeared just before the end to relieve me of the royal standard. <laughs> You're not getting away with that. <laughs> so anyway, there's River S. It's come to a um, hundred years, literally, from about now. And uh, it's been a tremendous time. I'm sorry, actually, the one thing that hasn't appeared on here. I thought I'd put it on. It was Ryan driving at Romney. So I'm very sorry, Ryan. You were on the show originally. And uh, I'm afraid we have to do the composing credits to Henry Greenden. So thank you and good night. Well, you're not escaping that quickly, Peter, because there will be some questions. Oh. Let's have a look and see what's there. Do I stop sharing or not? Um, it depends whether you want to be seen or whether you want to leave Henry Greenden. Oh, well. <laughs> We'll look at Henry. Where do these questions come up? Then? Uh, I've got them here. So you may, have, you may have got some of these as you've gone through. So oh, I've been, so hang on, let me see if I can find them. If you go to the questions or the chat. Is it show captions? Oh, it's chat. Yes, chat. Let's see what chat said. You'll see the first Mike Decker had a comment. Oh, he's designed a he did a Haywood. 
bar and pin, the seven and a half inch gauge. What have we got? And then David. David Andrew Collins is one about Riveresque and Muriel and whether Greenie was too busy. Well, this is the interesting thing about Riveresque. It's not really exactly the prototype of the Romney engines. What it does show is that Greenley got the Romney engines in inverted commas pretty right all the way through. <coughs> but somebody had to make mistakes for him to know that he needed to get it right. So I think the mistakes with Riveresque are possibly things that wouldn't have happened if Greenley had had his hand on it all the way through, mm -hmm. which is where this who designed Riveresque actually comes in. I don't know. We don't know. All we do know is there's a big bust up going on, literally at the time when the engine was being designed. Um, and as I say, the river, the, the Muriel thing was um, give it a decent boiler. Uh, and, and they thought about this earlier because one of the in inverted commas, um, interesting things that could have happened. It was in print back in 1919 that the people operating the railway here were going to reboil a Katie with a proper loco boiler. And I think if they'd have done that, it would have been a real eye opener, you know, equivalent of Bonnie Dundee, you know, small wheels, plenty of steam. So, yeah. Um, and then if you go down a bit, what got? Mike Decker has mentioned here the vacuum motor powered steam up blower on the Riverside and Great Northern Railway in Wisconsin. Ah, well, I think the one I remember in the engine shed, the vacuum bit was, I think it had died by the time we got there. Um, we used to just put a, a, a pipe up into the shed and the old fumes used to just ooze out and then. Oh, it was dreadful. And I'm sure the fact that, you know, some of us are now longer in the tooth than the drivers of that period um, can only be because the shed environment is healthier. Mm. And then uh, if you go down a bit more, uh, Sam Dixon mentions the South Tyndale Railway um, have been, have a look at the Burns Sawdust Briquettes. Uh, but what? also a railway in New Zealand who've been on Facebook this week and they've been with um, modern steaming. Yeah. They've been having a go with sawdust as well, which is very interesting. Well, and these olive stone things, I mean, it's going to be the way, even if you don't do it all the time, because do not the, not the Cumbrus, the other lot, Silverton people, I think they light up on mm -hmm. some sort of briquette because, you know, the light up procedure sort of fucked out half uh, Durango. Um, and we, we mustn't forget that in our recent dabblings with in different coal, the Ashpan steam has gone back on River S. So it now has Ashpan steam again. Mm. Um, so we're, we're relearning what you did in the Well, I'll, I'll, it, it, we, let, we, let, we reckon. That we got to, to sort of gas produce and we're Romney, didn't we, in May when you had a look in the smart box? There was evidence of stuff happening. The, the evidence of practicality of it is interesting because the bits you end up in the smoke box are almost like they've been eaten away. The gas has worked at them so that they become very, very light particles and they get dragged in um, and it only happens when the seam supply is adequate. I've just dug it out at home much, I must, because at some point it will be, um, what should we say, worth knowing now that fossil pan coal supply has died. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there'll be a coal from somewhere. Um, it's whether I mean, there were issues. Somebody uh, who uh, we in the society were invited to comment on the railway, among other things, becoming net zero. What in fifteen years' time or something? I mean, 
it'll be beyond my time, but um, other people may have requirements upon the railway. And if you uh, scroll down a bit more, Murray Tremlin is mentioning Jim Hillock's uh, KT supercharged 15 inch gauge engine that oh. at uh, uh, Moores Valley, which is not finished yet and hasn't been for a long time. Well, I mean, the, the KT is a very interesting machine. I mean, at least now, um, what should we say? It's proven that it can go up and down the line without completely snarling the job up. And um, the interesting thing, Stuart Harrison has got an engine at a seven and a quarter railway, and it has the same sort of marine firebox, as they call it, that Katie has, but they provide, and he's just got, a different sort of grate so that it basically lowers the fire down further so you can get more in and we're waiting to see what the end result is but i mean it's got to be better and something similar on katie could also that's quite apart from as you show what um uh, this this um replica chassis might perform yeah <laughs> as i say i think if if katie had been altered in um 1919, they'd have done the other two engines mm -hmm. and they would still be running to this day. River Ertz, as I say, for a cheap boiler. Uh, I forgot what River Ertz cost, but it was in the pounds. In, and, in uh, modern money, it was about seven and a half grand for River Ertz. And I think River Ertz was just under 30,000 pounds in modern money. Mm -hmm. Which is nothing really, is it? In this day, yeah. 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 so um, someone can share the picture. It looks like Green Dragon, yeah. Some some bits and bits. Oh, hi, so, hi, Peter. It's Trevor. Good evening. Trevor's, Trevor's there. <coughs> hi, hi Trevor's Peter. Good. Hello. Hi. You all right? Ex so excellent. Nice. Excellent. Brought back a lot of memories. That. Um, just, just two or three. How old were you in that picture? Oh gosh, eighteen, if that. Maybe well, young, maybe you younger. Started here though, then, had you? Yeah, but, well, but, but, but can't be any any younger than sixteen. Yeah, maybe I don't know. I'll tell you, I ago. just found it and I couldn't yeah. resist it. Oh, very good, very good. Um, yeah, the just odd bits and pieces. It, it's worth trying to keep jogging these young lads' memories with the coke and the photograph of the tubes leaking and that, that, of course, we filled these fireboxes right up to the top. Um, I don't think they really appreciate how we used to have to pack the bloody stuff in um, at, at the time, you know, total, totally different way of firing, of course. Um, other little bits of things, um, the running four trains around at Dalegartha, I think... In our time, you know, post-1973, I think we only did it twice, to my memory. Yeah. Mm. Um, you know, with, with, with the shuff, shuffle round. As I seem to remember, at one time we had... Um, Douglas had decided that we should have passenger tractor up there just in case. So we had to move that around on the very last movement to let the first train out. And dear old Mr P, Mr Pickup, managed to derail it on the points in front of the cottages. <laughs> So we just we just drove it back from whence it came and it went back on again. Thank you very much. Um, the shots of Royal Anchor out at Erton Road towing uh, River Erte, um, River Erton. I don't know whether you're aware, and that looks very like uh, there's a few like that on the RCTS photographic I website. There they are. I, yeah, I was looking. I... Yeah, if you, I mean, it's a while since I've been on. But yeah. somebody posted these photographs up some time ago. So it would be, you know, they'd probably been up a few years when I found them. Um, and they were, they were under these miscellaneous, what's going on here? Does anybody know yeah. uh, part of the, the, the system? Um, and I was able to add a bit of detail. But there's quite a few uh, of that particular 
instance, in, including one looking over Glyn's shoulders into the cab, and you can see that there's nothing more than 80 to 100 pounds of steam pressure on in the boiler, and yeah. the water's bobbing in the glass sort of thing. If you ever get a chance, I, I'm, I'm oh, guessing... I, I, I can remember of them. Yeah, I was looking yeah. for them this afternoon when yeah. I was putting this together. Yeah, that, that's that's where. I, mean, that... I wasn't I wasn't doing it to sort of um, crow over somebody's difficulties. It was no, no. We've all been there. No, no. I mean, this is this is why you know. I mean, the lads have gone through it a little bit recently with the change in the various calls that they've had to deal with, and you know, we came out of that era. In, into the anthracite era and, and ran for years without having to think about it. Yeah. Um, but it, it's interesting to to touch on how you've taken the whole, using River-esque, you've taken the whole story through from us not having any brakes and radios and <laughs> putting the engine in reverse and such like through to, through to the modern era. So, yeah, there was a lot of memories there. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. And have a good Christmas and see you in 2024. Yes. Go right. Good night. Everyone. Good night. Uh -huh.